Welcome to using the Excel add-in system with ANSYS Workbench tutorial. Microsoft Excel is the world's most used engineering tool. Many ways to use Excel with ANSYS simulation tools, including ways to drive ANSYS using the SDK and ANSYS as a service. You can use Excel as a solver system in Workbench through the Excel add-in. You can generate or edit design point tables, post process results, and much more. This demo will focus on using the ANSYS Workbench Excel add-in system as a solver. In this situation, Excel is just a solver system in the Workbench schematic. This Excel add-in does not drive Workbench, record results, or any of those things. There's a second available tutorial that takes a brief look at some other ways to use Excel in Workbench, and it includes a quick demo of how to import a solved DOE into a DX for post-processing. Many ways for engineers to use Excel. Uh, for instance, instead of hand calculations, an engineer could set up a simple solver using macros in Excel. This Excel system could then be connected through a parameter set bar in Workbench to any of the design exploration systems. In this particular example, a bridge has been designed with a simple truss setup and a number of calculations. There are some inputs, such as the number of spans and the length of each span, and there are some other pages in here that had trucks and so on. And then there's a macro that sets off the computation for the solution. Inside the Workbench toolbox, you can find the Microsoft Office Excel system and drag it onto the schematic or just right-click on the schematic to insert a Microsoft Excel system. You attach it to the Excel file, you set up your parameters, and you attach a design exploration system. Workbench makes it easy to set up the properties on this Excel system. You can also use a macro and enter the macro name here. We'll look at how to properly set up the Microsoft Excel spreadsheet and we'll look at how to do the setup in Workbench. And once you get to design exploration, it's uh, treated just like any other solver. So let's proceed to the live tutorial. Uh, in the interest of speed, I'm going to assume that you already know how to set up this project schematic. If we look, we can see that it's all here, starting with the, the geometry import, uh, the mesh, and then we go into the static structural setup. I've got a cylindrical support and a moment. And you can see here that the moment has been parameterized. We've also set up our solution uh, for total deformation and uh, equivalent elastic strain. And I also brought in this stress tool. Which this basically compares the equivalent stress on the part with the yield stress of the material. And uh, if you define failure as material yielding, uh, we want to keep the safety factor of our material above one. Uh, at the moment, much of it's failing. You see, as it twists, this all turns red as it drops below one. So to do that, we're going to want to vary the thickness of this plate and the width of this plate. Minimize my analysis systems and component systems. You can see my design exploration systems, and I simply dragged and dropped a goal-driven optimization system onto the desktop. Uh, once inside here, I went through my design of experiments. I set it up with a central composite. I went into the response surface. I set up a response surface, a standard response surface I'm looking at comparison of, of my width and my thickness and getting the resulting safety factors until the safety factor exceeds one. So I'm really only interested in the top half of this chart. So then I went to the optimization system. What we've got is my objectives. I didn't have objectives for width or thickness, but I did have an objective for my safety factor minimum. I said I wanted to exceed 1.1. I want to minimize my elastic stress and total deformation. So I take a look at my trade-off plots. Here you can see I've got a number of these points. The higher up we go, uh, the better we're doing in terms of, of these particular objectives. But this doesn't really factor in my cost. Yes, I know that I could go thicker and have a lower uh, stress and strain and all that. But what I would like to know is, how can I do this all for the minimum cost? And right now, it just doesn't give me that information. So let's go and add an Excel system that will calculate the cost of this plate. And then I can optimize for that. So I return to my project. And I expand this component systems, and I grab the Microsoft Office Excel system. You could call it whatever you want, uh, Excel cost analysis. And at the moment, it's not really connected to anything. And actually, let's go take a quick look at the Excel spreadsheet before we hook it up. So here's my Excel spreadsheet. You can see I've got some thickness and width coming in. Uh, and then there's a calculation. We have various prices. Here's my table of cost per length. And uh, then I did my calculation, and it's a series of if commands, not something you could do quite simply with the expressions in the parameter manager. So the length cost is cost for the length of my plate, but with a 12-inch width. And then when I actually divide it for the various widths, I get a unit cost as well. 
So now a very important step is to make sure that we use the name manager. So I would right click on one of these. I would say name arrange and then it pops up. It automatically reads to the left and sees that it's a thickness. You can see here it refers to this particular cell. You would say OK and away it goes. If you wanted to use filter, you could go and put something in front of this like workbench or something like that. So that if you had a number of these, it would only pick out the ones you wanted. I'm going to just cancel this because I already set this up. Here's my name manager. You can see here are my four parameters. Before here, I put three of them with the WB in front, but then this length cost, I put a ZZ in front, uh, just so that we could filter it out if we wanted to. So close. So then this Excel spreadsheet is saved. Uh, I can close it out, and I go in here and I load it up. So I'm going to say Add File. Here's my thin plate cost. Now at the moment, I use this Workbench parameter key. So now if I double click on this, you can see it only included three of those. If I return to project, and I remove this workbench parameter, I can right click on here and reload the file, and now I'll get all four parameters. I'll even get this CC one. So you can decide how you do it. Once you're inside, you can go to the input and say which ones are input parameters, and which ones are output parameters. So now when I return to my project, you can see that it hooks up the parameters in and out. More importantly, now I would go into my parameter set bar. And I can see all my parameters. Now, before what I have in the particular model, there's, there's several widths, but they all need to be equal. So uh, we use the expressions down below. So for this W2, I said that W1, 2, and 3 are the same in the description. And the actual expression is that I've just set it equal to P7. The same for W3, I've just set it equal to P7. Uh, radius, I didn't need to set. Thickness, I didn't need to do anything with it. That's just the extrusion depth of this particular model. So then down here for width earlier, what I'd done, just so I could post-process easier, I'd said that width is double W1, and I've set the expression to 2 times P7. So we want to use a similar equation for the width here. So input width for that Excel spreadsheet expression is 2 times P7. And you can see this changes color, so it's no longer editable. It's now a gray background, and it's 2 times P7. Uh, same for thickness. I can say that thickness is equal to P12 just so that the input to the Excel spreadsheet is the output from Design Modeler. Now there's some other outputs down here, so cost analysis outputs. And so these have not been solved yet. So this all is set up now. I return to project, my design of experiments. And you can see it hasn't quite caught up with us yet. Let's refresh this project. And now we get our Excel cost analysis in here. These are all outputs because they're calculated from the inputs. Our only inputs are W1, thickness, and moment magnitude. Uh, radius was unchecked, so it's not going to be factored in. And we need to create a new design of experiments. There's various types in here. In this case, I'm just going to Central Composite Design, Rotatable, Enhanced. I usually like to preview the design of experiments before I update them. So scroll this window over a little bit. And you can see they're all in the inputs are all set up. The outputs have not been yet. Next, I would update my design of experiments. And the Excel portion, of course, is very quick, but this does involve a static structural solve, so it takes a few minutes. So at this point, I'll probably get up, go get a coffee, and I'm going to pause the uh, recording for you. So coffee breaks over, and I'm back, and you can see we've got this table all filled out with my various safety factors for each of my design points. And I see the 30 design points or so. I'll return to my project and I'll go and take a look at my response surface. And again, I'm going to keep the same type of response surface, second order polynomial, uh, and just uh, update it. This part of the process doesn't take very long, it's just a 20 or 30 second thing. So now it's done solving. I can scroll down here past all this tree, and I can check out things like my min max search. See so my goodness of fit right here. The mesh min and number of elements are turned off. Uh, but I could also go in here and look at, uh, maybe I don't want to see that length cost. I just want to look at unit cost. And even for unit cost, you can see that there's some that are stacked up vertically. That's because there was some jumping going on as things were rounded down or rounded up. So I wouldn't expect this to line up perfectly, but you can see that it does follow the, the diagonal fairly well. So then I jump to my response surface. It starts out as a 2D response surface. We'll change this to 3D. So here we're looking at safety factor. Or we're actually more interested in looking at the cost. So I pull this down, I go to unit cost, 
So here's my chart of unit cost. It looks like it's going to range from, you know, somewhere in the 15 cent level up to the 35 cent level. But I still want to pick my best one that's going to pass not just here, but also pass my safety factor and so on. So let's go with the optimization. So back here, I jump into my optimization. You can see here the method, there's screening and all these different methods. I could have picked a multi-objective genetic algorithm or NLPQL if I just wanted one objective. But you could also use the min-max for, for really optimizing. But I'm going to double click on here to get it in and actually control the most important part of the, the setup, which is the actual objectives. So I have no objectives for width or thickness. But I'm not going to worry about those. I do have an objective for safety factor. I need it to be greater than or equal to something like 1.1 just to be safe. And uh, I might also want to go over here and say that I want to minimize my elastic strain just like before. And minimize my total deformation. Now these are pulling it up into the corner, making it thicker and wider to minimize these. But my main goal is that this unit cost be minimized. And so I would set that as a higher priority because this is pulling in the opposite direction. This is saying I want to pass that threshold of safety factor but with the minimum cost. So I say update optimization. It takes in that information and it tries to solve. And it could use that multi-objective genetic algorithm, but in this case it's just generating samples. It creates a trade-off plot and then I can easily see on the trade-off plot where it is. So here are my three leading candidates that it thinks will give me the best situation. They're not quite along the manufacturable values. They don't have the right, the right thicknesses in here, so maybe I pick this one which has the closest thickness and then I could insert it as a design point in the other table and then edit it to make this a full you know, inch thick and 0.75 or something like that and see how that turns out. Or I could talk about manufacturable values, but since we're focusing on Excel, we'll say focus and not get into that. Uh, here's the trade-off plot. We're just looking at the feasible points and I can take a look down here at x-axis. We can say the x-axis maybe will be our thickness and you can get an idea of how this thickness plays across. But the y-axis, let's put our cost. And you can see here that the blue ones are along the bottom of the cost axis. Lowest cost, highest quality. And you can actually do a 3D chart as well. And now you get an idea of how the thickness and width combine to give you the lowest cost. Uh, so you can pick one of these or you could go with the study. If you right-click on any of these, you can also insert those as a design point. Alright, so that's how we've used Excel as a solver to calculate unit cost.